Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about Alex Straza. I really debated whether or not I wanted to make this video a why the pros play, and I kind of decided that I wouldn't do that just because the pros, or at least the CCL pros, have barely played Alex Straza. And I figured it was kind of interesting on the reasons why they haven't played or, or, or uh, used Alex Straza in, in a lot of different maps. And, and that's kind of where this video came in, is what happened to Alex Straza. I did a video like this for Anna, what happened to Anna, and it was when she had kind of a drastic decrease in popularity. Well, Alex Straza's decrease isn't going to be as drastic. Um, she's going to go from about 17% popularity in the competitive scene to about 1% to 2% popularity in the competitive scene. Um, which is pretty drastic if you think about it, but I do want to talk a little bit about her history and the reasons for this drop in popularity. So this is where we're going to kind of get deep into that. So a lot of times when Alex Straza gets brought up, people think, well, she's just so easily countered and there's so many mages that throw abilities out. But in reality, the way that she's played, um, that never really bothered her in HEC, and the reason why is because the more coordinated people get in in a competitive scene like HEC, um, the the more all of the abilities come out in a predictable manner. What I mean by that is, if a single CC lands in HEC, generally everyone on that team that landed the CC would throw every ability at whatever that CC landed on. Meaning, if a stun hits, the mage is going to throw every ability into where that stun hit. So an Alex Straza is pretty safe to throw her abilities right after someone on your team gets CC'd because they're going to take a bunch of damage and then if they survive that damage, they'll get healed and there's no downside in throwing your W out. Which is part of the reason why her W build was so popular is because you would have people throw um, the W out directly after um all of that damage went out and you would get a big heal and that's also another reason why pacify was so popular because um someone would get stunned and you would have the ability to pacify one of their high damage dealers so that all that damage that's about to be thrown um wouldn't happen keep in mind that we're going with a pretty low subset of matches so the win rates are going to be a little weird you can see only seven games so don't take any of the win rates really too seriously right now because this is only from master leagues hgc i've i've sorted only by the hgc matches what i mean by that is i've only sorted by hgc 2018 finals um the eastern and western clashes as well as the phases for each region and that is all that i looked at i didn't want to look at any of these other games um for hgc i primarily wanted to look at just 2018 17 percent played 47 percent win rate and if we looked at the um the overview of the teams that actually played this you can see that the teams that that tended to win were had much higher win rates with her so team liquid ended up getting uh i believe around fourth um they had pretty high win rates with alex straza and demic got i think seventh um and again 63 percent win rate where like tempo storm got dropped rather early um lfm was basically uh i think they were eighth place in north america miracle was um like eighth place leftovers was a team that that did really well and again 80 percent win rate so these win rates are kind of more based on the teams and so she was used by a wide range of teams and her win rate was kind of more based on the teams that played her rather than her herself so with that being said what did happen to alex straza i've seen some comments on reddit where people say oh she's just been nerfed and she's just too weak these days but this is from 2018, and in fact, it was from the second half of 2018. Um, so if we looked at the second half of 2018, we can see bug fix, bug fix, fix buff. We can see um, nerf to the thing that they just buffed, but it's still way more buffed than it was before. We can see fixes to a couple things um, with that. We can see a buff to her W and a buff to her R. We can see a buff to her entire E build as well as uh, her Q. We can see a buff to her entire W build, um, and we can see buffs to her W. And once again, we can see buff to both W and Q build. So if she's only been buffed since 2018, and 
she was played in 18% of the games then, 17%, or, or at least played or banned in 17% of the games then. Why is she almost never banned now? And why is she almost never played now? And that's where we're going to need to get into a game. And this is a game uh, between Chili Mountain and this is a CCL game between Chili Mountain and uh, Heroes Hearth. Um, not Heroes Hearth. Uh, Wild Heart. Alex Straza is being played by Banana. And I'll be honest, I don't think this is the best Alex Straza gameplay that I've seen. In fact, this is probably pretty weak for an Alex Straza game. Um, so this is part of the reason why I didn't want to do like a why the pros plays because I don't think we should really be focusing on this play style. I don't think Banana is a bad player by any means. I think he's a great support player, one of the better ones in Europe. But I just really don't think he played a very good Alex Straza. And I feel like I have a little bit of credibility with Alex Straza as she was kind of my secret weapon in my initial climb to Grandmasters. In fact, I wrote a pretty extensive guide that went over four different builds and when you should play them. Um, and I had about a 70% win rate with Alex Straza on the way up to Grandmasters. So she was kind of one of my mains at a time and one of my favorite heroes from the, uh, almost the entirety of this game, she's been my favorite hero for at least as long as she's been out. Um, so I feel like I have a little bit of credibility in there and she's been a hero that I've watched a lot in competitive play. So when she disappeared from competitive play, I've always been kind of looking at why. And I think the number one reason why she's disappeared from competitive play is really the stigma of her. Um, because people aren't seeing a lot of success with Alex Straza, it, more people don't want to play Alex Straza. I think that's the number one reason. However, there is a secondary reason, and that's based on how team fights are being played these days. And before you guys think I'm going to be talking about how mages are more popular and that they can throw more abilities, I still don't think that's really a counterpick to Alex Straza, or at least as much of a counterpick as people think. The real reason why I think Alex Straza has been losing a lot of um, playability in the competitive scene is because the meta has gone tankier and tankier and with slower and slower fights. With us seeing double tank, double bruiser, as well as double healer being more and more popular, especially on the maps that Alex Straza was best on, Alex Straza's kind of screwed. And what I mean by that is Alex Straza wants short fights on timed objectives where she can get a value out of her Dragon Queen and her heroic ability. She has some of the best heroics out of all the healers in the game, and she also has Dragon Queen, which is basically a secondary heroic. Because she has to be balanced around basically having two of the best heroics in the game um, at the same time, then she the rest of her healing has to be weaker. And so if the team fight is going to be very long and drawn out, where double healers are used to keep everyone alive for these long fights, then her Dragon Queen times out and she becomes a worse healer and it's like you're down a healer when the enemies have two healers. So the reason that she stopped being played in the competitive environment is primarily because the meta shifted to want slower fights. Um, where the reason that she stopped being played in Storm League is because I would say more the stigma. Um, Alex Straza is a lower win rate hero. She sits around 48-49%. She's a lower popularity hero, where she's only played about 5% of the matches, um, making her just a hero that people don't think about a lot, and a hero that people think is weaker and not that good. When in reality, I personally think Alex Straza is very strong, albeit she's deceptively difficult. Um, what I mean by that is she seems very easy to play because her abilities are very easy. She has a point and click heal, she has an easy to land. Um, heal as well but because she seems pretty easy she's actually rather difficult uh her w can bait your team into bad situations and if you use it incorrectly you can really have um your team get die for heals also if you don't use it enough you can find your healing just way too low so you need to use it often but also use it in ways that your team won't die for it your Q is a point and click heal, but if you use it too often, you heal yourself basically out of a team fight. Um, and your dragon and your ult are very long cooldown abilities, even though they're very powerful, if you use them at incorrect times, then you won't have your most important tools and basically won't have a strong healer when you actually need them. Because of those three things, it makes Alex Straza very timing based and extraordinarily difficult, even though she has very easy abilities. 
So this makes it to where not only does she feel weaker, because we're not seeing her in competitive play, but she also just is seems weaker because for the people that are playing her, um, the lower skilled players are going to really struggle with her, where the higher skilled players are playing things that are more meta right now. And so that makes it seem like the only people playing Alexstrasza right now are people who don't understand her timings, making her seem a lot weaker than she was. Um, when I used her with a 70% win rate to Grandmasters, we were in kind of a similar meta situation. Um, and this is before all of those buffs that she just got. So she's stronger than she was when I used her to carry to Grandmasters. In fact, I wasn't the only one who did it. There was a, uh, a Grandmaster who hit Grandmaster multiple seasons in a row on multiple accounts named LCD. LCD was known for basically just playing Alexstrasza the entire time. And this was another good example of someone who utilized Alexstrasza for what she was useful for. If you have her timings down and you know when to use her abilities, she's very, very good. Keep in mind, this gameplay is a little weird. I think I mentioned earlier that Banana did not play this that well. Um, but he did use Alex Straza more for like siege and utility, which I thought was interesting, but not really how I would recommend using Alex Straza. On this map, Alex Straza was often banned in the competitive environment against teams that had a good Alex Straza player because it would almost guarantee you would win objective. Now, I don't think it's as much of a guarantee anymore, seeing as we have heroes like Hogger, we have heroes like D.Va that can be very, very powerful for winning these objectives, even Sonya. Um, so I don't think she's as strong as she used to be on this map. However, it isn't a role that isn't as strong at winning this objective. So while all of those are fought over for the bruiser role, you basically have a powerful way to win the objective within the support role. And that's another reason why I really liked Alex Straza for climbing is that she could carry specific objectives in a healer role, which is pretty rare. And so she was one of the few heroes that I had a 75% win rate with her, or 71% win rate with her, because I only picked her when she was in her best. I never picked her on maps that I felt that she would be weak on. I picked her when the objectives were timed, and when the enemies couldn't walk away from Dragon Queen. If they walked away from Dragon Queen, we won the objective. And if not, then we won the team fight. And so that's how I played her. So... Now that we've kind of seen why Alex Straz is not played, because these fights have gone slower, and um, because her best maps have been kind of dominant with some other heroes that are just a tad bit better on those maps and other roles, um, why is she being played? Well, she's being played this particular game because every major hero that was normally meant to win these objectives in the Bruiser role had been banned. Augur, Sonya, Diva, all of those have been banned. Which then opened up the opportunity, well, what do we use to win the objective? Sure, there's like Kerrigan, there's um, other kind of more situational options, but people haven't seen Alex Straza in a while, so they don't necessarily know how to deal with her. And that's the primary reason why she was drafted here, is because she's not being played a lot, and people don't know how to deal with her. The downside is that I feel like Banana isn't that practiced with her. The upside is that the enemies don't really know what to do. When she goes Dragon Form, do you dive on her? Do you not dive on her? Well, when she was being played a lot, everyone knew what to do. Okay, she went Dragon Form. Do we have the opportunity to jump on her and kill her before she knocks us away? Yes? Okay, let's do it. No? Okay, we back out of the fight. And people were a lot more practiced in how to handle an Alexstrasza. But they were also more practiced in when to use your abilities. And so this game was a strange game because they got so far behind in the beginning that it became kind of a weird one. They're down seven kills to zero and we haven't even seen a Dragon Queen yet. And if we have, it wasn't impactful at all to the point that I don't even remember it. Um, he decided to go Q build this game. The Q, Q build, full Q build was kind of um, not the build that that most people ended up settling on nearing the end of HEC. Most people went like W or like a W hybrid build. Um, where in like Nexus Gaming series, most people have kind of gone to like an E build. I don't personally like an E build in competitive just because what E build does is predictable and um, it's easy to counter in competitive. Where U and W build are less easy to counter. Remember, in competitive, everyone's gonna throw their abilities at the first CC. So you can see, 
the the um immortal sorry the punisher jumped on diablo now diablo put his spell armor on first um and then started a breath everyone threw all of their abilities at diablo but it didn't do anything because he had that 75 armor well now it's easy to throw down a heal at diablo and no one has any abilities left to throw at diablo because they've already thrown all their abilities at diablo so now the whole team could walk into this w pretty safely without any concern and that's part of the reason why in competitive a good Alex Straza is pretty hard to counter. Now, it kind of sucks that it's used this way, um, but you can see everyone's pretty healthy. Alex Straza did take a chunk, um, and Alex Straza just healed everyone back up, and they were able to clear up this objective without taking a hit on their key. Now they can engage if they want to, as their entire team's basically at full health. And so that's what's interesting about Alex Straza is she kind of brings a very unique um, way to kind of turn fights because she brings a dumb amount of healing um, to fights that are going where you want them to go. Meaning an objective is starting, you know that the fight's going to happen, and you can bring a dumb amount of healing. Overall, I think this ult wasn't necessary. I don't think that they, unless they really were going to commit to this fight, she should have saved her her ult for maybe engaging on like a camp or something um but she should have her her dragon back up by the next objective so they were able to keep themselves alive they, they kept their their keep alive and they continued on um the one fight we've seen a dragon they've won and so what we're gonna notice here is from this point on every single fight the banana uses dragon they win so if you can make sure that you're fighting over something with a valuable reward, meaning that if you win this fight, you get something else. That could be a camp, that could be a keep, that could be a, an objective. Whatever it is, you need to be able to win another thing by winning that team fight. And as long as they pick those battles well, they are going to win every fight for the rest of this game, or at least every fight that matters. And that's really how Alex Straza should be used. So Alex Straza was picked because people are unfamiliar with playing against Alex Straza. They don't know if they should be diving on her. They don't know if they should be throwing abilities at her. And they don't know if they should be leaving the fight or joining the fight. Even though he isn't the best Alex Straza currently, and he makes a lot of mistakes this game, um, that doesn't mean that this playstyle of Alex Straza doesn't work. Um, it's just that it's one that the enemies are not really ready for. So... They might need to give up this key because they're not 16s yet. The Leoric is trying to get 16s, and the Alex Traza is just playing safe. In Q build, you don't want to take any damage because if you loot, if you take any damage, you go below the 75% health, which means that you lose Life Blossom, you lose uh, the Live and Let Live, and you also lose Exuberance. So you can see he stands behind structures whenever Chromie's throwing out abilities, and then he'll walk out, throw a heal when his team walks back, he'll pick up the flower, and then he'll go back out again. He's just staying back, and he's playing very, very safe. You can't always do this, but when you can, it is pretty valuable to do. One thing that I I personally recommend for Alex Straza players that are not playing in competitive that want to get more value, you can throw Ws back here and ping on your way before you throw the W so that your team knows that you're doing that, and your team will generally have time to get over to that heal. Now that he's level 16, we see that he does take up the Draconic Discipline, and he does have that Pacify. So like I said, what often will happen is if a CC goes out on one of his allies, he can walk up and he can Pacify someone, and then heal that ally. And if he does it fast enough, he can actually get cooldown off of Pacify. Healing a stunned, rooted, or silenced ally reduces Pacify's cooldown by 30 seconds. So if, let's say for example, uh, Diablo gets stunned, he pacifies the URL and then immediately heals before the stun ends, he's got a 30 second cooldown on pacify. I've actually had fights where I've pacified four people in one fight. It's really difficult, um, but it is very possible. Um, in fact, I had three pacifies out at one time and I had four pacifies out throughout a small fight. Um, it's pretty rare that that happens. The biggest chance of that happening is like a long duration silence that you get multiple auto attacks off that resets it. Um, but yeah, it, it can be pretty incredible. Um, 
Roots are another one. Like if you're against a Mephisto that's doing like long roots on your team and you're in dragon form, each auto attack is basically going to reset the cooldown of pacify. So Mephisto goes in, you pacify him, you auto attack, your team resets the pacify, you pacify their tank or, or their bruiser, and then you auto attack again, you have another pacify, you pacify whoever's left, and you basically can pacify a team. The pacify is kind of like a secondary ult, um, or at least it, it's just really valuable. So, they've lost every objective up until this point, and Leoric's kept, um, kept them in the game by the experience-wise, while Alex Strauss has kept them in the game by the structures. So, now that we've reached this objective, they're on the same talent tiers, they're down by a level, and now let's watch how this plays out. Alex Strauss throws down a W, Alex Strauss throws down a Q, Alex Strauss throws down another Q, goes into dragon form, throws down another Q, a W, and the W is going to be able to heal the, uh, the Diablo, and now the enemies need to walk away from this fight, but they can't walk away from this fight because the, their team already has 20 on the objective. So now Alex Strauss is keeping everyone on her team alive. She goes into dragon form, goes into her ult. Her ult then keeps everyone alive throughout all of the rest of this fight, while her team's drastically winning this objective because the enemy's drafted two healers. She is out healing both of the enemy healers and her team won the objective without much of a concern at all. And this is what I'm talking about. The enemies can't leave or they lose the objective. And the enemies can't stay and fight or else they're fighting into a dragon. And even against two healers, the dragon out heals both of those healers. And so this is what I'm talking about on why Alex Straza was picked in HEC a lot of times on this map and why she was so successful and banned so often on this map is that she is very valuable here. Um, now, I think there's a lot of areas where um, Banana could improve, and that's something that the more people start playing Alex Straza, the more we'll see um, adjustments on that. Um, but I do think that we'll see more Alex Straza on this map because you don't need to run double healer, uh, and it opens up your draft to run more damage. You can run uh, different bruisers, you can run more damage, you can run uh, a wider range of team comps. Um, because of that, Alex Straza is your answer for the objective. I, I've said before um, that there's two ways to draft when you're on this map. I mean, there's, there's several ways to draft on this map, but there's two ways to draft on this map when your goal is to win the objective. You can draft with four people having the goal of winning a team fight and one person with having the goal of clearing the objective. Um, or you can draft uh, with four people focused on doing damage that is uh, also going to clear the objective at the same time. And they drafted for that kind of secondary nature. Um, Falset has a lot of abilities that do AoE damage that clear the objective while dealing damage to the enemies. Diablo deals damage to the enemies while clearing the objective. Leoric deals damage to the enemies while clearing the objective. And so does Odin, um, which is Tychus's ult. So their entire team is drafted to deal damage to the enemies at the same time as dealing with the objective. Where the opposing team... They, they kind of went more for the team fight route, but they didn't have one hero really good at clearing the objective. Um, generally, you're going to want like a Sonya or a Hogger, a D.Va, um, or even like uh, a Kerrigan, or sometimes even just like a Ghoul Dan is fine. Um, but that's kind of the two directions that you go if you're drafting to win this objective, is either one hero to clear the objective and four for a team fight, or just five that, that fights on the objective. And Alex Straza is by far the best hero for that playstyle. Um, I would say best healer. Um, first, best hero is probably debatable. I think Hogger probably still takes that. Or if you're trying to fight on the objective. Um, potentially Sonya. Spin Sonya can be really good if you're fighting on the objective. But um, I, think, I think she might even take the cake on over those because like you just clear so fast if you're left alone and you're a healer so it's like you take a role that's not contested bruisers are so contested on this map um where healers are not so it's it's just unique i do think that we'll start seeing a lot more alex Strauss on this map um especially in the competitive scene because she's not contested um and because she's so powerful on this objective so I do expect to see a lot more Alex Strauss on this map, and I really don't think that that um, Ana is going to be the counter to it for the reasons that I said before. When people follow up their team in competitive, um, they're going to throw all their abilities at once. Well, if if uh, Ana holds back her abilities, 
um, and holds back her grenade too long, then the hero is just going to walk away. And if she throws the grenade early, um, like if she doesn't throw it early, the gift of life is going to heal a lot. If she throws it early, then the abundance is going to get the heal. And if she throws it perfectly timed, then the extra W is going to come out as well. So right here, we see a huge fight over this camp. And this fight is crazy to me because this fight is kind of suicide for both teams. So I think, and the camp isn't worth that much. So either team should really choose not to take this fight. But it's really interesting how this fight goes out. So the, the abundance, oh my bad. So the abundance goes out, and hopefully it, it okay. The uh, the abundance goes out, and and she's just keeping everyone topped off and making sure that that everyone's good. So the abundance goes out. Now right here, I would have abundanced and then immediately gone into Dragon Queen and gotten that reset. Yes, the shrine's gonna spawn soon, so I'll try to hold my ult, but. This fight, the enemies seem to be committing into it, and I would want to make sure my team's full health. Um, so I would immediately dragon form here, but he decides to hold off his dragon form for a little bit later, and because of that delay, they end up actually losing two people. And so that's something that really bothers me, is that if you're expecting a fight, and this is what I said it's so difficult to play Alex Straza, is because she's so timing-based. Um, you you need to have your abilities casted before you need them rather than after you need them. Because if you cast it when after you need them, it, the fight's already over. So uh, Diablo comes back because he has souls, and he gets to stay in dragon form because of uh, both his his trait was or his ult was used to stall dragon form, but also if you hit enough targets in it, it can add those extra 15 seconds onto, uh, onto your dragon form. And so now his team it does pretty well. His Leoric's back up. Um, the Tychus is the only one that's not up yet. And the opposing team has two people down. They end up getting a good, uh, a good Entomb. And he reveals them with his E. And the permanent slows from the E can also be really nice if he's getting those resets. Um, so they take a little longer than I would have liked to get this, uh, this objective up. Um... And he ends up staying in a pretty safe position because he doesn't know where the enemies are going to be. They 39 the objective, um, deciding if they want to push with the objective, they want to first deal with whatever's happening mid lane before they push with the objective. And so now, again, like I said, once they realize that they can use Dragon or the objective and only for the objective, they've basically won every objective, or at least... Um, I mean, they, they've won every objective since since Alex Strauss started showing up, basically. Um, so, he doesn't focus too heavily on landing E. E without going E build is not that valuable. Um, it's decent slows, but it's not like crazy. Um, so, Odin was popped this time. He saves his dragon form, he saves his ult, and um, he's doing whatever he can to, to get to his team, heal his team, without losing too much. He throws out a W, but he's going to ult... Oh, sorry, he's going to go Dragon Form, actually. So his Abundance is going to keep Cattle alive and give Cattle a pretty huge heal. Um, and he's just going to do what he can to heal here. If he needs to move to the other area of the fight, he can always use his ult. But in this case, he's just going to do some damage and try to save his ult for um, pushing under the objective. His Abundance full heals everyone, and he's ready to go. So now they can go to the objective. The enemies have used some ults, and he still has his ult available. And they have the objective basically whenever they want it. They take the objective. They go back down again because they're concerned that the enemy team is going to try to push down at them. And that is what the enemy team tries. They go back down here. And so this time around, he has his ult. But remember, the ult even has a delay on it. So he has to cast it before his team needs healing. And this time he did it perfectly. He casted it before his team needed healing, and he was able to get there, do some extra damage, get into dragon form, and assist his team. And so now, he is a lot more valuable for his team. A great gust pulls the enemies back in, and the enemy, uh, or and his punisher is also looking at the, uh, the enemy keep right now, so they'll be able to close out this game. This game was a lot closer than it should have been, but the differences he made in this game were absolutely and incredibly huge. Um, he was a little slow. If he was a little bit faster on some of his reactions, uh, this game would have been a lot more valuable in his direction. And also, if he would have abused the fact that he had Dragon Form at level 1, which most people don't have their ults until level 10, 
Um, that first objective of the game, I think he could have won as well. So with a couple changes, I think he could have turned this game from a close win to a complete stomp. Um, and that's something that we'll probably be seeing more of when more people start playing Alex Straza again. I think after all of the buffs to Alex Straza, I really expect to see a lot more Alex Strazas being played, especially with Diablo, because um, we're in the competitive environment. I think Soul Shield's just absolutely necessary. But outside of the competitive environment, you can take the, the globe talent with Alex Straza and with Diablo, and it makes Diablo almost unkillable during team fights. So there are a lot of strategies that you can do. And that's another thing that I like about Alex Straza. She has a lot of synergies between different heroes. Um, with Lifebinder being very powerful on high health heroes like Stitches or Cho'Gall, um, or even with like Garrosh, and then also having uh, Cleansing Flame, um, the W, the, the Globe talents are really good on specific heroes. So she synergizes really well with a lot of heroes, but keep in mind she's more difficult than people think that she is. The biggest thing that I would say if you're looking to play Alex Straza in the competitive environment, pick her in the right maps with a little bit of synergy. And if you're trying to play her in Storm League, pick her in the right maps. The maps that I liked her in were any maps that were timed, like Sky Temple or Infernal Shrines, where if you use Dragon, they basically have to walk away. Or my only other maps that I would sometimes pick her on is maps that, um, that if the enemy team doesn't have um, a lot of poke, I will pick her on maps that you have to channel objectives, like uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen. Sorry, not Tomb of the Spider Queen. Um, Towers of Doom, First Hollow, and the plant map, Garden of Terror. Um, the reason that those maps, if the enemies don't have poke, is because if you go dragon form and you scare off the enemies and they can't interrupt the objective, then you win every objective that you have dragon form, which is probably half the objectives. And you might even win the other half of the objectives purely off of the lead that you created from the half of the objectives that you won already. And so when I played her, I would pick her on like Cursed Hollow whenever the enemies didn't have poke. And I basically would have about an 80% win rate on Cursed Hollow just because of that. And that would happen quite a bit. She also speeds up Siege and Race if you do end up picking her on maps that are in other areas just because of her E. Um, but it's not going to be as fast as someone like a Karazim. Uh, it's just something that's kind of nice to have. So there's definitely those pros and cons. I would recommend not picking her on maps like Volskaya, Onomura, or Alterac because the objectives are very slow and drawn out. And people can just walk away from the Dragonite and then go reclaim the objective after you're, you don't have your Dragon. Uh, not Dragonite, Dragon form. Um, so that gives you an idea of when I picked her and when I recommend picking her. Um, in... I would say lower divisions, you can utilize any of her builds um, in competitive. Uh, in fact, there was uh, the, the team that won Division D last season in NGS, they actually went full E build on Alex Straza and Random Morales. And the Morales would keep the Alex Straza alive and they would pick her on maps that the dragon form could stall the objectives, or, or, or sorry, eliminate the objective. They would play her on Tomb of the Spider Queen and you would dragon form every time that you lost the objective and it would clear out the objective. And then they used, once they hit level 20 in full E build, they would stim drone the Alex Straza in dragon form. And the Alex Straza would attack super fast, gaining her entire health bar back and having almost no cooldown on dragon form because she got those resets from level one, how it synergizes with your level 20 talent. Um, I don't recommend that in like standard games, but if you're in like uh, competitive and you're just curious for having some fun with some weird builds, definitely. Uh, I think Alex Straza can still be very, very good. She has a lower than average win rate, but if you count for the fact that she's difficult and also she's not great on every map, then I think that lower than average win rate is pretty good if you're looking at picking her in the right situations. All of that being said, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I know it was a little bit different from some of the other videos that I've done, but hopefully it was entertaining in the least. Feel free to check out any of my other videos. Um, and I do also have that other video of like what happened to Ana, but um, I think that was a little bit more of a drastic video. We're starting to finally see some Ana back in competitive play too, which is kind of Yeah, thank you guys so much for watching.